How did we as a culture get from wearing tunics, robes, gowns, and togas to cargo shorts and mom jeans? How did pants go from being a sign of barbarism to being one of the only requirements to eat at a Waffle House? And why do we call them pants? So what was it that led to the invention of pants in the first place? Tunic and gown-wearing ancients must have had an overwhelming pile of cultural and practical reasons to abandon that breezy, free-flowing feeling enjoyed still today by those who wear dresses, skirts, kilts, and bathrobes in favor of wrapping each leg individually, right? Doth mother know you weareth her drapes? Well, no. There was really only one reason for pants, and that reason was horses. As Science News explains, the oldest known pants come from Central Asia between 3,000 and 3,300 years ago, among nomadic herding cultures who found pants the best option for riding horses. The oldest pants so far discovered are from China's Tarim Basin, but pants were also worn by other nomadic equestrian cultures, like the Scythians about 2,500 years ago. These early pants were straight-legged with a wide crotch, sewn together from wool cloth with slits on the side, a string fastener, and decorative weaving in the legs. Interestingly, the Tarim Basin pants seem to have been woven to their final size with no cutting involved in their shaping. No word on whether the first pants wearer's mother embarrassed him in front of the entire nomadic shopping mall by making him come out of the dressing room and turning around to show how they fit on his butt. The ancient Greeks were not a pants-wearing people. They didn't like them. Instead, they tended to wear long, flowing linen or wool garments that were belted or pinned in place. Men usually wore a linen tunic, over which they might wear a wool cloak in the winter. Women wore tunics pinned at the shoulder. Greeks hated pants because, as Vintage News explains, they thought they were ridiculous but also because they associated them with foreigners. Pants were what Persians and other cultures wore. They were the clothes of barbarians, not a civilized Greek. The Romans, of course, followed the Greek attitude on pants. The Latin word bracatus, which literally means wearing pants, was used to refer to people that Romans thought were foreign, barbarous, and, perhaps ironically, given our modern view of pants, effeminate. As Atlas Obscura points out, Roman hatred of pants was pretty much just straight-up nonsense, with the circular logic that pants were not sophisticated because sophisticated people don't wear pants. When the great Roman orator Cicero wanted to condemn the behavior of Gauls, he referenced their military cloaks and their breeches as signs of their innate aggression. However, by the time of the early empire, Roman soldiers were suddenly discovering that the swishy potato sacks with armholes that worked so well in a Mediterranean climate weren't up for the job of retaining territory in Germany, Switzerland, Britain, and elsewhere. Taking cues from their new Gaulish allies, Roman soldiers began wearing pants to protect their borders and their thighs from the Goths. Before long, this military fashion caught on with civilians as well, and by 397 CE, in the waning days of the Roman Empire, brothers and co-emperors Honorius and Arcadius issued a decree banning civilians from wearing pants in the capital. In the end, though, bad news for the Romans meant good news for pants. The trousers ban ended when Alaric and his pants-wearing Visigoth army sacked Rome, more or less making the fall of the Western Empire in 476 inevitable. In a complete 180 from the Roman pants ban stands the mandatory pants reform of Peter I of Russia, better known as Peter the Great in the 17th century. Wherefore the Romans' pants were a symbol of barbarism and otherness that needed to be wiped out, for Peter they were a sign of civilization and modernity that needed to be brought in at any cost. Plus they made dancing easier. Mamushka, mamushka, he comes with one mushka. When Peter became sole czar of Russia in 1696, the country hadn't progressed much in about six centuries. The isolationist Tsardom was ruled by a wealthy class of nobles called boyars who, together with the crazy powerful Orthodox Church, maintained their wealth and power thanks to an enormous, powerless serf class. The fashion of choice was long robes, long coats, and long beards. However, Europe of this time was experiencing an explosion of progress in technology and trade and was soon knocking on Russia's door. Peter had been raised by a Western-educated mother and had himself traveled through Enlightenment-era Europe in disguise and soaked in their culture, and he was determined to drag Russia kicking and screaming into the 18th century. A major element of his modernization efforts was wardrobe reform, which meant robe-wearing boyars suddenly found themselves forced to wear pants and other Western-style outfits under penalty of a hefty fine if they tried to enter Moscow. Peter's reforms met a lot of resistance, but pants won out in the end. The word pants can be pretty funny. It turns out that comedy is in the very DNA of the word pants, so maybe that's why. But these are my recreation clothes. You probably already know that the word pants is short for pantaloons, but what you might not know is that pantaloons is an anglicization of the Italian word pantalone. Pantalone, in turn, was a character in a hugely popular Renaissance-era form of Italian comic theater. 
As Merriam-Webster explains, Pantalone was a greedy, lecherous, scheming old man who often ended up being duped and humiliated, and who could be recognized by his costume, which included a brimless hat, an open black cassock, and long trousers. When a similar style of pants became popular in Restoration England, they named their new fashion after the comedy character famous for his pants, like how super short cutoff jeans would later be called Daisy Dukes. While pants is the generic term for a garment worn from waist to ankles while covering each leg separately in American English, the preferred term for such a garment in British English is trousers. The word trousers can be traced back to a Gaelic word meaning close-fitting shorts, which by the 1570s could be found in English as trous and then trousers a decade later. The R at the end probably got added by the influence of drawers and other words described as a pair like tweezers and pliers. But even in American English, where it's not the generic term, trousers can be heard in certain contexts. Specifically, trousers is used to mean a tailored pair of pants with a waistband, belt loops, and a fly front. Why are you wearing trousers? <clears throat> Slacks, meanwhile, indicate less formal, untailored, usually off-the-rack dress pants, which are often made of smooth wool knits, which tend to hang, wait for it, slack. Khakis are dress casual pants, usually light tan in color. Chinos are flat front dress pants, often light beige in color. And then there are jeans, but hopefully you know what those are. Before the full-length open leg trousers we know today became the default form of pants, European pants took multiple different forms. Namely, these are breeches, pantaloons, and knickerbockers. Prior to the late 16th century, the main term for leg coverings was hose, which were generally separate coverings for each leg joined by a codpiece, but these were replaced by breeches, which were a single sewn-together garment. Breeches usually ended right below the knee or midway down the calf, with either boots or stockings worn below if a gentleman wanted to show off some of his sexy leg day gains. I can do the splits, no problem. Breeches fell out of fashion by 1820 and were replaced by pantaloons, which were slimmer fitting and reached down to the ankle. By the 1840s, looser fitting trousers replaced the tight pantaloon, inspired by sailors who popularized the look. But knee length pants saw a resurgence in popularity in the 20th century in the form of knickerbockers, which are baggy knee pants that end at or just below the knee. Half pants, right, Mr. Franklin? Knickers, in fact, yes. He's in his knickers. These were popular for young boys in the early 20th century and remain popular today for sports uniforms. Never has the difference between two styles of pants been bloodier or more political than during the French Revolution. The militant radical partisans of the lower class common people of France during the French Revolution and Reign of Terror were known as sans culotte, meaning without breeches. This might make you picture a much sexier revolution than actually occurred until you realize that no breeches doesn't mean they didn't wear any pants, just that they didn't wear a specific kind of pants. What's going on? Is that French Revolution type of thing? Culotte in this instance refers to knee-length silk breeches favored by the aristocracy against whom the rebels were rebelling. The working-class radicals who would come to be known as the sans-culotte wore ankle-length pantaloons or trousers. The sans-culotte were the radicals who called for the executions without trial that led to the reign of terror. So definitely not as cute and charming as there's an army in France and they don't wear pants might have you believe. Still, the association between knee breeches and aristocracy stuck, which caused them to fall out of fashion in the 1800s. Pants, of course, have for most of history been considered men's clothing. But hey, pants are for everyone! In the early 1850s, a women's rights advocate named Amelia Bloomer suggested as rational dress for women a costume made up of a short jacket and a knee-length skirt under which would be worn loose ankle-length trousers. While the full costume didn't last, loose-fitting women's trousers, once very popular for women to wear while bicycling, and of course women's baggy underwear would continue to bear the name bloomers after their most prominent advocate. The fight to make pants a gender-neutral garment in Europe and America has been a long one. It was technically illegal for women to wear pantalon in Paris thanks to the violent reputation of the sans-culotte. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, pants became a more common accessory for some working women, including coal mine workers known as pit brow lasses and pilots. Designers started making pants for women, and they began being considered leisure wear, but women wearing pants in public could still cause a scandal, as happened with actress Katharine Hepburn. Fortunately, World War II helped to normalize the idea of women wearing pants thanks to them becoming common for women working in factories during that time. Even though the progress has not been quick or steady or even unidirectional, it has become much more the norm for it to be cool for women to wear pants when they want to. Here's a thing that confuses even native speakers of English. Why do you call them a pair of pants? It's only one thing. 
Two pairs of pants sounds like it's describing four things, when in fact, it is only two. One popular explanation tries to justify this by saying that in the olden days when pants were pantaloons, they were actually two separate things where you put one on each leg and then fasten them in the middle. If you've been paying attention, however, you might note that while this describes medieval hose, this is not true of even the earliest pantaloons. Britannica says nah too. According to them, there's not really any evidence to support the two-piece pants theory. The fact is, pants is just a linguistic phenomenon known as a plural tantum, which is Latin for plural only. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. English has no shortage of such words. Examples include electronics, odds, surroundings, and thanks. However, English is especially fond of making pluralia tantum out of items that split or divide cleanly into two symmetrical halves. Pants are a natural fit with their two legs that meet in the middle, as are scissors, tweezers, pliers, and glasses. You never say a scissor or a plier. Also, all of these are described as being a pair despite being technically a single item. Pants aren't really that fancy after all. Unless, of course, they're fancy pants. Shoes just aren't practical for a dead body. They might not even fit. Plus, nobody wants to decompose in a toxic soup. Here's why people are often buried without shoes. The next funeral you go to, lift up the lid on the bottom half of the coffin. If the sudden surge of loved ones yelling and shouting doesn't distract you, you might notice that the deceased isn't wearing any shoes. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you. Way from there. Why? Well, it turns out that this is fairly common in burials, at least in Western culture. You might guess the first reason for this. Since many coffins only show the upper half of a dead person's body, putting shoes on is simply unnecessary unless the family of the deceased requests it. In fact, since these coffins only show half a person's body, you could probably get away with burying someone without pants, too. But there are other reasons for the dead going shoeless as well, including ecological, practical, and physical concerns. After a person dies, their body undergoes an array of changes such as rigor mortis that may distort their extremities or even bloat them. In other words, it's unpredictable whether or not any of the dead person's shoes will even fit anymore. Over the years, some companies have made special slippers for this purpose. Half a century ago, the shoemakers at the Practical Burial Footwear Company made stretchy shoes that could fit over a distorted feet of a dead person who had undergone rigor mortis. But during the expensive funeral process, a grieving family might not want to make an additional purchase that many would consider unnecessary. Going barefoot is free, and as it turns out, it's a whole lot better for the environment. In fact, as Wilson's funeral advice explains, even if the family opts to display the body with shoes, the shoes are often removed before the casket goes into the ground. See, many modern shoes are made from artificial materials that take a long time to degrade and can potentially leach chemicals into the soil. According to The Guardian, the materials used in some shoes virtually guarantee that the soles won't break down for up to a thousand years. For ecologically minded families, particularly those opting for an otherwise green burial, this might not be something you want to happen. Of course, the same thing goes for all the clothes the deceased might be wearing. Many kinds of clothes aren't suitable for a green burial, according to Funeral Guide. What kinds of materials are fit to go six feet under? Untreated natural fibers like cotton, wool, linen, hemp, or bamboo are acceptable for green funerals. But any artificial materials, even small details like elastic waistbands, polyester linings, or metal zippers, are kind of off limits for a natural burial. Our only requirement is that it be biodegradable. Everything must break down. Besides all of the above reasons for the dead to go shoeless, there's another factor, price. Have you seen the price of quality footwear these days? One traditional way of dealing with a deceased person's shoes is giving them away as gifts. It's not a new idea. In the Middle Ages, shoes could be bequeathed by name in a person's will. This didn't just have economic benefits either. People believed this was a way of keeping the spirits of the dead person alive. Even if the decedent has not requested a green funeral, if they are cremated, they may not be allowed to wear shoes. Treated leather and rubber soles are considered hazardous to burn for safety and environmental reasons per funeral guide. Finally, for many cultures, it's traditional to be buried in a shroud instead of a suit or dress. In these cases, shoes are typically not worn since a shroud is long enough to cover the feet. In Judaism, for instance, it's traditional for the deceased to wear a white linen shroud called a takrikum. These simple white coverings were conceived to exemplify the idea that in death, everyone would be equal regardless of how much money they had in life. Other religions use funeral shrouds too, particularly Islam, and they can be found across cultures all around the world. You might have heard the expression, knock em dead, related to fashion. Often, the meaning of this phrase is anything but literal, but there is one exception. 
Back in the Victorian era, the green dresses as sold in a very specific jewel toned shade was killing it, literally. Fashion enthusiasts of the Victorian era were so bent on making an impression in the dim, gaslit rooms of their time that they went to all sorts of extremes. One of these extremes was arriving in dresses that were painted a deadly emerald green color. Not only were these frocks fully capable of killing the people who had them on, but they were so dangerous that they could take out an entire room. You, what happened here? Well, Uncle Albert was just having his tea and he dropped down dead, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah? Might have been poisoned. Poisoned? Indeed. Sounds like an exaggeration, right? Not quite. The British Medical Journal described a woman wearing such a dress as a killing creature. She actually carries in her skirts poison enough to slay the whole of the admirers she may meet in half a dozen ballrooms. It's clear that these dresses were a devastating trend, but what exactly made them so toxic? The popularity of the emerald green British Victorian dress is proof of how much people can be willing to risk in the name of fashion. These dresses were, in fact, dyed with enough poisonous arsenic to kill 20 people. It's a wonder anyone would want to wear one at all. The deaths they caused were particularly gruesome. The body would first be ravaged by scabby ulcers. The initial reaction would be followed by the vomiting of blood and eventually fatal organ failure. One ill-fated seamstress was exposed to so much arsenic that she claimed on her deathbed that all she could see was green, as if the world had taken on a spooky emerald hue. Given the heinous nature of these deaths, you might assume that fashionable socialites were unaware of the risks that wearing such garments carried. Quite the contrary. Medical professionals made every attempt to address the health crisis, but to no avail. Apparently, when it comes to wearing muted tones in social settings, these femme fatales would have preferred to drop dead. Speaking of dropping dead, there was another thing that made this particular dye less than lovely. When this arsenic-laced dye made contact with certain household materials, such as wallpaper, it produced an unmistakable mouse-like odor. It's difficult to imagine this fatal frock gaining any admirers whatsoever with the stench of dead rodents wafting through the air at every turn. This horrid smell makes sense, given the toxic ingredients of the dye. After all, arsenic was pretty much synonymous with rat poison in the Victorian era. Interestingly enough, it seems only visitors from far off lands, like a foreign dignitary who came to see Queen Victoria in Buckingham Palace, complained of the smell. It is possible that locals never noticed it because they had become so accustomed to it. As time wore on, this toxic emerald hue was literally everywhere, on the walls and the floor, on the frocks and the gloves. Victorian Britain was basically bathing in toxicity as arsenic found its way into fashion, killing and maiming everyone in its path. How was this allowed to continue? While many blamed fatalities resulting from these green frocks on those fashionistas who wore them, the truth is that Victorian Britain was painted the shade of corporate greed. Arsenic acid was only regulated when sold on an individual level. Indeed, acts like the Arsenic Act of 1868 failed to regulate the large-scale manufacturing of the toxic hue by major corporations that stood to gain massive profits from the poison. This is despite the fact that doctors and physicians began speaking out in the late 1850s. It wasn't until 1895 that stricter regulations relegated arsenic-related death to a dark page in fashion history's past. Even then, high levels of the toxic tint were still found in fashionable packaging on things like shoeboxes and storage accessories. According to the New York Times, toxic substances and carcinogens are commonly found in green fashion to this very day. Some shades of green are not only harmful to the wearers, but also harmful to the environment itself. The phrase dress code might evoke strict high school uniform regulations, but it is something athletes must often contend with as well. Case in point, the Norwegian women's beach handball Olympic team made headlines on July 20th, 2021, when they were fined for replacing the traditional bikini bottoms of their uniforms with shorts. As reported by CNN, the European Handball Federation fined the team 1,500 euros, 150 euros per player, for improper clothing, since the team members knowingly went against the uniform regulations laid out in the International Handball Federation Beach Handball Rules of the Game. These regulations require that female athletes wear bikini bottoms with a side width that must be, quote, a maximum of 10 centimeters or 3.9 inches, with a close fit and cut on an upward angle toward the top of the leg. The male beach handball athletes, however, are required to wear shorts that fall 10 centimeters above the kneecap, although they can be longer, so long as they are not too baggy. The Norwegian women's team's coach, Eskelberg Andreasen, 
told CNN that the regulations might discourage women from taking up the sport and that the team was willingly accepting the fine after years of fighting for the right to choose shorts over bikini bottoms. Andreasen pointed out that uniform regulations are a difficult thing for many players and that he was particularly concerned about women from majority Muslim countries choosing sports other than beach handball in order to avoid the bikini bottom uniform requirement. The Norwegian women's beach handball team received props for their stance, with the Norwegian Handball Association tweeting their support for the athletes, saying, for CNN's translation, We are very proud of these girls who, during the European Championships, raised their voices and announced that enough is enough. The team might break through and get their wish to wear shorts someday. The IHF and EHF both said they are, quote, committed to popularizing beach handball. All contributions in that respect and measures that will support the ambitions of this attractive sport are supported, according to CNN. The federations asserted that the topic of uniform requirements for females was spoken about at the April 2021 EHF Congress, and that the ongoing discussion would continue in August with the newly elected members of the Beach Handball Commission. How is that a thing? I, How did that I, even get to this point? This is so inexplicable to me. I honestly wonder, wonder if they live in the real world. Sometimes regulations veer in the other direction, though with officials regarding female athletic attire as inappropriate because the outfit covers too little. Paralympic world champion Olivia Breen of Wales told CNN that she'd been speechless after being told at the English Championships that her sprint briefs were too short and inappropriate. Breen said that she'd gone public with the exchange to raise awareness of the unfair scrutiny, stating, You have no right to say what I can and can't wear. She also noted that the briefs were specifically designed for competition and that she had worn similar ones for years without any other complaints. Breen said to CNN that uniform regulations shouldn't make women feel self-conscious while playing sports. Breen explained, When you are competing, you want to feel as light as possible to make you perform better. She also asserted that wearing briefs rather than shorts made her feel, quote, more free. Olympic dress codes vary wildly for men and women, according to Bustle, which notes that 2016 was the first time designer Ralph Lauren, who has created the Olympic team uniforms for the United States since 2008, put both men and women in pants. In the past, the uniforms for women athletes had included skirts, while the same men's uniforms worn for the game's opening ceremonies offered pants. The article called this a step toward holding male and female athletes to the same standards by not overtly sexualizing or othering Team USA's women. Other dress code difficulties faced by female athletes include the banning of Islamic headscarves, which effectively bars some athletes from competition. In a regulation that has since been overturned, FIFA once banned uniforms with any political, religious, or personal statements which meant Iranian women couldn't compete in the 2010 Youth Olympic Games. Women started qualifying for the Olympic Games in 1900, reported the BBC, making up 2% of the athletes. They competed in five sports, including tennis, where they played in long skirts to their ankles. Women fought to wear garb more suited for sports back then, and they continue to do so. Why do the Royal Guards at Buckingham Palace sport those unique hats? Are they really made from bearskin? And why are they so tall? Millions of people across the world who were hooked on the Queen's elaborate funeral plans were once again fascinated by the famous Royal Guards' wardrobe choices. According to the Ministry of Defense, the Royal Guards are some of the oldest infantry regiments in the British Army. They were created by King Charles II in 1656, and they have since seen battle in various conflicts, including both world wars and Afghanistan. While there are quite a few hurdles to hop over first before you can even dream of donning the signature hat, the Royal Guards are still going strong and were an integral part to the late Queen Elizabeth II's recent funeral ceremonies. Despite being iconic across the world, the truth of these bearskin caps continues to encourage controversy, despite royal guards wearing them for centuries. The truth is, the fascinating origins of this intriguing choice in hat wear harken back to the heyday of the British Empire. The black bearskin cap formerly had a historical purpose in signifying prestige, and was worn by distinguished foot soldiers and guards. Surprisingly, the roots of these British black bearskin caps may be traced back to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. 
This battle is often remembered as the bloody climactic battle of the Napoleonic Wars, in which Britain emerged victorious and Napoleon was eventually exiled. Even if they weren't a fan of his politics, the British certainly admired Napoleon's flair for fashion. Napoleon's Imperial Guard, composed of his most elite soldiers, donned black bearskin helmets to appear more formidable to their foes. Understand that these bearskin caps were originally 18 inches tall, designed to make charging soldiers look terrifying. The British later replicated this aesthetic for their own royal guards as a way of demonstrating their prestige and pride in their triumph, and the tradition stuck. However, the furry headgear was not the only thing the British borrowed. The royal gold bearskin hat chin straps are another borrowed element from the original bearskin caps. While they may appear amusing in the present day, some believe they serve a useful purpose in protecting the chin and determining exactly where an individual guard falls in the larger hierarchy of the royal guard. This is because individual regiments must wear this chain over the lip, while some wear it just above the chin. So where does Britain get the bearskin from? After all, black bears haven't called England home for quite some time. The solution is, predictably, controversial. The black fur required for these bearskin caps is imported from Canada, according to British Heritage. These black bearskin helmets aren't cheap, with one cold bear used to make one hat. Surprisingly, each one costs 650 pounds. That's somewhere in the mid-700s range in US dollars to produce. In 2021, The Independent reported that the Ministry of Defense spends hundreds of thousands of pounds every few years when they order a fresh round of bearskin hats. Many notable animal rights advocates have expressed outrage, and one petition to change the bearskin fur to a faux fur alternative from February 2022 even received a response from Parliament. The petition claimed, There is no excuse for the Ministry of Defense to continue to effectively fund the slaughter of bears for ceremonial headgear, since an indistinguishable alternative has been produced, which is waterproof and mimics real bear fur in appearance and performance. For over two decades now, Peter has been urging the MOD to swap to a faux alternative. According to National Interest, the British Army protests that the faux fur alternatives just aren't the same, because the synthetic oils and materials used to make them become too waterlogged and lose their signature shape when it rains. The Parliament responded to the faux fur petition in part, Currently, we have no plans to end the use of bearskins. Bear pelts that are used are the byproducts of a license called by the Canadian authorities to manage the wild bear population. Bears are never hunted to order for use by the MOD. Given how famously bad British weather is and how deeply entrenched the British monarchy is in traditions, it could be a long time before these black bearskin hats become vegan. Which mother of famous historical world leader died because of unfortunate footwear? Which 19th century fashion item was problematically flammable? Find out all that and more as we reveal some of the deadliest clothing of all time. The Victorians had a complicated relationship with arsenic. They knew that it was deadly. Great Britain even passed two different bills that restricted how much arsenic one individual could obtain. But in a key oversight, that legislation didn't account for industrial use. Some people who made artificial flowers were at risk of ingesting arsenic-laced powder that was used as the pigment for the fake leaves. And in 1861, flower maker Matilda Shearer died painfully after ingesting too much over the course of her short career. As recounted by the Paris Review, it all really started in 1775 when chemist Carl William Sheila mixed sodium carbonate, arsenious oxide, and copper sulfate. The solution produced a bright green dye, eventually known as Sheila's Green, but proved to be both irresistible and deadly. Wearers of the dye could gaze in horror upon skin ulcerations while also wondering if they were poisoning their fellow partygoers. What's worse, the dye was so loosely applied that it could easily be shaken out while a wearer was dancing or making small talk. Shirt and jacket collars may seem pretty innocuous, but for some men in the 19th century, they were death traps. But it all started as a convenience. The detachable collar was invented by New York housewife Hannah Lord Montague in 1825. Sick of laundering her husband's shirts when the collar got dirty, she realized that she could simply create a separate collar that kept him looking tidy while sparing her extra washing. Eventually, highly starched collars became all the rage, though they were occasionally referred to as father killers. The reason was that if a man were to become unconscious, perhaps having one too many brandies, then he might slump forward and the overly stiff collar would then cut off his airway and blood supply. This might sound far-fetched, but it reportedly did happen on occasion. In 1888, the New York Times wrote about one man who was found dead in a city park, having apparently gotten drunk and then passed out on a bench. When his head fell forward, his fashionable collar cut off his breathing. And a 1900 edition of Daily Mail and Empire reported that another unfortunate victim was found dead in his bed. The cause of death was determined to be a collar so tight that it choked him and caused bleeding in his brain. 
You don't mind if I borrow your neck for a moment, do you? Silk is expensive, but in the early decades of the 20th century, advancements in chemistry made it possible for people to enjoy all the luxury of silk without the high price point. But for the people manufacturing this other fabric, the price of fashion may have been a bit too high. The fabric in question was viscose, a subtype of rayon, which is itself a synthetic material that must be made in a factory-type setting. It was initially hailed as a wonder product thanks to its many applications, but workers who produced it were exposed to carbon disulfide. This toxic substance resulted in significant mental health disturbances, to the point that some workers had to be physically restrained from jumping out of second-story windows after exposure warped their minds. Even if someone could detox from the carbon disulfide, they weren't necessarily in the clear, as even the seemingly lucky survivors were more likely to develop Parkinson's disease later in life. Meanwhile, the people who wore viscose or rayon clothing experienced no known side effects at all. If you've ever worn high heels out for a night on the town, then you know that these fashionable shoes can sometimes present a bit of a gamble. The higher the heel, the more likely you are to take a nasty tumble. But could it be so dangerous that it can actually kill you? That's apparently what happened to a late 19th and early 20th century socialite named Jenny Jerome. In 1874, she married Lord Randolph Churchill, thereby becoming Lady Churchill, and she would eventually become the mother of future Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Jenny lived a rather dramatic life, serving as a nurse during wartime, acting as a writer and editor, and navigating the intense and sometimes cutthroat world of British high society. But it all came to an end in June 1921, when at the age of 67, she was rushing down the stairs at a friend's manor. Her high-heeled shoes caused her to slip and break an ankle. Even worse, the fracture became infected to the point that her leg had to be amputated. But that still wasn't enough, as that leg's artery eventually began to hemorrhage, and she died later that month. Skirt length has seemingly been a never-ending topic of discussion over the years. If you went to Catholic school, for example, you're surely scarred by memories of nuns whipping out their rulers. Many of the teachers of the nuns would be able to say, get on your knees, and if, uh, if your skirt didn't touch the pop can, you got a detention. But there was once a time when skirts were considered too long, and not just because they weren't on trend. Instead, the problem was that trailing skirts were bringing death and disease into the home. During Victorian times, more and more people began to accept the legitimacy of germ theory. Yet urban sanitation was still catching up to this realization, so streets across the globe remained a bit of a dangerous petri dish. Thus, a particularly cringeworthy sight was a woman with a long skirt dragging through all of that diseased muck and then returning home to her unwitting family. By 1900, many people believed that deadly diseases like influenza or typhus could be brought into the home via these skirts. Some women even reportedly resorted to devices meant to hitch up their skirts while they walked about. To be fair to the fashionistas, it wasn't just the ladies who were carrying disease. As detailed by the book Fashion Victims, The Dangers of Dress Past and Present, garments made in many contexts, from bespoke to ready-made, could bear disease-carrying bugs if the workshop it came from was contaminated. Unless you think that the Regency and Victoria era had a lock on deadly fashion trends, just take a look a little closer to home at the 1990s and early 2000s. If you were old enough at the time, you may have sported a pair of fashionably sandblasted jeans. But you probably didn't realize that those jeans that are now tossed away in a dark corner of a forgotten closet came with a deadly cost. That's because sandblasting can seriously afflict workers with a disease known as silicosis. Manual sandblasting requires an air compressor, a hose, and sand, which means that fine silica dust often floats around workers. Without protective equipment, which can be in short supply in poorly regulated factories, workers inhale the dust. After a while, they can suffer irreversible effects like shortness of breath, weakness, and persistent coughing. Some even become permanently disabled. In the worst cases, silicosis can be fatal. It's been a documented problem in places like Bangladesh, Turkey, and China, where Al Jazeera reported on poorly ventilated workspaces producing genes for brands like American Eagle and Hollister. For well-to-do people during the Victorian era, when fashion was extreme and regulations were erratic or downright non-existent, mourning wasn't just a time for grief. It was also a time to be fashionable. Women especially were expected to follow a restrictive set of customs. At the height of this trend, widows were expected to spend a full year in deep mourning as they wore all black dresses made out of a dull fabric. And when they dared to venture outside, they would put on veils covering their faces. After a year, it was socially acceptable for them to lighten things up a bit in the second morning and half morning stages, which implemented a bit of color, but of course, not too much, lest they appear to enjoy the loss of their husbands. Ironically enough, all that black fabric could be deadly. 
Early synthetic black dyes included the likes of benzene, arsenic, chromium, and other toxic chemicals. Wearers sometimes suffered skin irritation and damage to their respiratory system, as well as digestion issues. And as some doctors argued, wearing too much of this fabric could even potentially lead to death. Ballet dancers today have to deal with some serious bodily consequences for their art, from pressures to maintain a certain weight to the toe-crushing forces demanded by point shoes. But you probably won't see a modern ballerina going up in flames anytime soon. Unfortunately, dance trends of the past meant that this was once a fiery reality due to a 19th century trend for gossamer skirts and stages lit by oil lamps and candlelight. The flowy fabrics encouraged the free circulation of air, and if flames got too close, this could also mean the rapid growth of fire. That's what happened to ballet superstar Clara Webster, who died in 1844 after an oil lamp touched her outfit. Other dancers dressed in similar clothes stayed away for their own safety. And in 1862, ballerina Emma Livery died of blood poisoning over the course of an agonizing eight months after her skirts caught fire on stage. She could have worn a costume that had been chemically treated with fire retardants, but the compound made skirts yellowish and overly crisp. Considering that dancers made or broke their careers on such aesthetic decisions, it's not surprising that livery declined the treated skirts. It was only a relatively brief fashion trend, but the hobble skirt proved to be a serious hindrance to many women. The height of this fashion happened between 1905 and 1910, when the long restrictive skirts were so tight at the bottom that they impeded a wearer's gait to a characteristic hobble. For many, it was merely an annoyance when they wanted to keep up with a group or make their way from one room to another. But for an unfortunate few, the trend proved deadly. One such incident, recounted in the book Fashion Victims, occurred at a race course near Paris in 1910, when a horse bolted through a crowd. Most people got away, but one woman was so restricted by her skirt that she remained in the animal's path. She fell beneath the horse, and with her hair caught in its shoes, she was dragged along for some period of time. She eventually died of a skull fracture. And in 1911, the Adelaide, Australia newspaper The Advertiser reported that two women had died in a boating accident in a Russian resort. The reporter rather harshly blamed their drowning on the, quote, imbecile dress that hobbled them at the knees, despite their apparent reputation as good swimmers in other outfits. How can a woman possibly fight in this? Fight? We use our principles. Lest you feel smug for being a modern person living in a world that's mostly free of arsenic lace dresses and typhus laden coats, why don't you go take a look in your own closet? Perhaps you've got some ready made strangulation hazards waiting there for you, whether it's a fashion scarf or your go to necktie for formal occasions. These may seem like innocuous accessories, but try telling that to someone like dancer Isadora Duncan. Except you can't, because Duncan died in a 1927 car accident when her long trailing scarf became entangled around the open axle of a car. When the automobile began rolling, she was violently pulled from the car by her neck and died within seconds. Neckties also have a bit of a deadly history. In 1934, the New York Times reported on the death of a company manager whose cravat was caught in a machine. And even as recently as 2001, a New Zealand man suffered a similar fate when his more modern necktie was caught up in a sanding machine as reported by the New Zealand Herald. So keep all this in mind the next time you get dressed, as the life you save could very well be your own. The crown that was placed on the head of King Charles III at his coronation was perhaps the most special in the British monarchy, but it wasn't the original. Here's what happened to St. Edward's crown. People who only know a little about monarchies might imagine that a king or queen walks around the castle with a five pound crown on their head. In reality, monarchs only wear crowns at specific rare events. They don't want to minimize the impact of seeing a massive collection of diamonds, sapphires, pearls, and gold in one piece of headgear. Besides, as the late Queen Elizabeth II said, the imperial state crown is unwieldy. She only wore it once a year when addressing parliament and had to stop doing even that. St. Edward's crown, however, is worn only once in a monarch's lifetime, at their coronation. In a BBC video from 2018, Elizabeth gets reunited with St. Edward's crown after 65 years. Is it still as heavy? Yes, it is. The last time she'd seen it was the first and only time she'd worn it at her coronation in 1953. That crown, however, is a reimagining of the original. The new St. Edward's crown, worn only six times by six monarchs over its 362-year life prior to King Charles III, was crafted for Charles II in 1661. The original was melted down in 1649 following the disastrous reign of Charles I, who was executed during the English Civil War. That earlier crown is believed to have dated back to the 11th century, according to historic royal 
oil places. Under normal circumstances, anyone at all can have a look at the current 362-year-old St. Edward's crown sitting on a pillow behind glass in the Tower of London. On May 6, 2023, though, it wasn't on display there. It was being used in Charles' coronation. The Royal Collection Trust reminds visitors who have seen the crown that it is not a reproduction of the medieval design, although it does share some design elements with the original. It has four fleur-de-lis, two arches, and four crosses Looking at the current St. Edward's crown is like gazing at an altered reflection of the 11th century original, but even the crown that got tossed in a furnace in 1649 might not have been the very first crown. According to the University of Illinois, the first written mention of St. Edward's crown dates to 1220 at the coronation of Henry III, a full 150 years after Edward the Confessor, after whom the crown is named, died in 1066. Edward's crown supposedly passed to William the Conqueror, who, after crossing the English Channel from French Normandy, lived up to his moniker and became King of England the year of Edward's death. But we've only got pictures to go on for Edward and William's crown connection, specifically the Baia Tapestry, an 11th century piece of art depicting William the Conqueror's exploits. In it, William's crown sort of looks like Edward's crown, but there's no way to know for sure. The mystery deepens when we take a look at Edward the Confessor's canonization. Edward became a Catholic saint in 1161, about 400 years before King Henry VIII split from Catholicism and formed his own Christian branch, the Church of England, in 1534. That's when people started keeping track of Edward's old crown because it became a holy relic. Specifically, the crown became a second-class relic because Edward, a canonized saint, personally owned it, Treasures of the Church notes. The court jeweler takes the story from there. When Edward was canonized in 1161, monks from Westminster Abbey, the same one that stands in London to this day, got a hold of the relic for safekeeping. They claim that Edward told them to use the crown for future kings, despite Edward having died 100 years earlier. Turns out, the monks lied. The abbey was looking to attract pilgrims to visit, and knew that having a holy relic in their possession would do the trick. But since the first written record of Edward's crown comes from 1220, nearly 60 years after Edward's canonization, there's really no way to tell if the crown that the abbey held onto, and then got melted down in 1649, was Edward's at all. It's only certain that it passed to William the Conqueror. Whatever the case, any other crown besides the current St. Edward's crown remains lost to history or destroyed. In ancient Rome, trousers were on the outs, by law, and it was a matter of culture as much as comfort. These days, pants are such a staple in menswear that it's easy to take them for granted. In fact, there are some who find men in anything but some form of trousers to be wildly controversial, which is sort of weird. Why? It's 2019, and I want to feel sexy too. Is that so wrong? For starters, there was a time in ancient Rome when a man wearing pants was considered objectionable. Let's start here. If men weren't wearing pants in ancient Rome, then what were they wearing? As Atlas Obscura explains, Roman fashion for both genders can be summed up by the two T's, or tunics and togas. Tunics were casual and togas were worn for fancy occasions. At its peak, history says the Roman Empire spanned roughly 2 million square miles. Within that vast space were many different cultures, each one with its own style of clothing. It was this Roman point of view on certain colonized people with whom the Roman Empire frequently fought throughout history that led some Roman men to consider breeches to be the distasteful clothing choice of the unwashed, uncouth hordes. Around 50 BC, Roman armies led by Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, or what is now modern-day France. While fighting in Gaul, Caesar encountered native people whom he considered uncivilized. And what were they wearing? You guessed it, pants, which were most often made from animal skins. The same proved true of other Germanic peoples the Romans came across as they conquered Europe, many of whom were called barbarians. The famous Roman poet Ovid recounted what one group of people he met in Romania looked like, as well as what they wore, including trousers, writing, The people, even when they were not dangerous, were odious, clothed in skins and trousers with only their faces visible. During this time, trousers or pants came to represent an otherness to the people Rome conquered and with whom Rome fought to keep under control. University of California Berkeley historian Suzanne Elm explains it this way. Good orators were using rhetoric in a rather sophisticated way. They were picturing foreign tribes in the way that mostly suited their needs, and they were relying on visual imageries to make sure that barbarian otherness would stand out. Wearing pants was just one example of this deviant behavior. The writings of Roman historian Publius Cornelius Tacitus suggest that as late as around AD 100, pants wearing was still considered the domain of uncouth foreign hordes, alongside river bathing and ponytails. Around that same time, though, Roman soldiers began wearing a kind of trouser they called a brocci. These early versions of the common trouser were made predominantly of wool and held up by a drawstring, and were better suited for the colder, more northern climates where the Roman armies were fighting much more often. 
As pants-like attire became much more common among the ranks of Roman soldiers, they also became more popular in the general population. To quell this trend, men were not allowed to wear pants under official decree. Around the year 400, Roman emperors Honorius and Arcadius issued a decree stating, no person should be allowed to appropriate to himself the use of boots or trousers. Those caught in such attire could be exiled, but as Elm points out, that ban likely had less to do with the pants themselves and more to do with keeping trousers the sole domain of the military. No matter what, though, Roman culture was changing, and like bell-bottoms in the 1960s or skinny jeans in the 2000s, pants fashion led the way. Around a hundred years after that decree from the Roman emperors Honorius and Arcadius, Rome had fallen to these same pant-wearing Germanic tribes. Those were groups like the Visigoths, which the Romans referred to as barbarians. With that, pants wearing slowly became less taboo, and according to professor and author Kelly Olson, trousers were even then worn in the only remaining Roman court in Constantinople. Olson notes in her book Masculinity and Dress in Roman Antiquity that by the 6th century, Roman opinion on pants had completely changed. Long sleeves, fitted tunics, and pants were common in the court of the Roman emperor. Olson explained, If you were close to the emperor, that's what you would wear. Bearing all that in mind, it's safe to assume that Romans then and now still put their pants on one leg at a time, just like we do. These jeans are from heaven above. Elvis Presley's sudden style change in the late 60s led to many guesses as to why he started wearing jumpsuits. Here's what the man who made the king's clothes had to say about the sartorial shift. Elvis was famous for his velvety voice, hip-shaking dance moves, charisma, and an outrageous lifestyle. He was also famous for his iconic, instantly recognizable outfits. The black leather suit for his 1968 comeback special, the velvet suit he wore when he was invited to the White House by Richard Nixon, and of course, the spangled jumpsuits he wore on stage. All of these outfits and more were designed by the same man. Bill Ballou was a graduate of New York's Parsons School of Design. He designed costumes for performers including Lena Horne, Josephine Baker, and Ella Fitzgerald, as well as for a variety of stage productions including Sweet Charity, Funny Girl, and the New York City Ballet's production of Giselle. He also worked on several television specials and programs including the Emmys, the Grammys, and the American Music Awards. Ballou came to work with Presley when producers of The King 1968 comeback special asked Baloo to submit some designs. Baloo had worked with the same producers on another television special featuring singer Petula Clark. Baloo told Salon that his first idea came to him immediately. It always seemed like people assumed he wore black leather, but he never did. At that time, though, we were into denim, and I said, what if I just duplicate a denim outfit in black leather? Elvis loved it. That collaboration kicked off a nearly decade-long partnership in which Baloo's designs helped Presley create a new, flashier, more theatrical presence both on and off stage. Baloo told Salon, I wanted the clothes to be easy and seductive, and that was it, and I never wanted anything to compromise his masculinity. I had to protect his image. In 2008, costume designer and historian Butch Polston, who owns the BNK Enterprises Costume Company and considered Baloo a mentor, described to the Los Angeles Times the design details Baloo incorporated into Presley's jumpsuits. Baloo used high Napoleonic collars to frame Presley's face, adding Edwardian pointed sleeves and wide bell bottoms with kick pleats. Famous costumes included the burning love suit, which was red with a pinwheel pattern. There was the so-called black pyramid suit covered in gold studs, and the dragon suit, which featured a dazzling rhinestone dragon motif. Presley's favorite, said Polston, was the peacock suit, which featured embroidered peacocks with the tail feathers running down each leg. It sold in 2008 for $300,000, USA Today reported. The jumpsuits had some practical benefits outside of looking dazzling and outrageous. Reportedly, the jumpsuits were made in response to Elvis's request for stage clothes that were easy to move around in. At the time, the king had become obsessed with martial arts, especially karate, and his stage moves in the 70s evolved beyond the hip-shaking of his early years, so he was looking for a style of clothing that was both athletic and fabulous. Baloo's jumpsuits were the answers to Elvis's prayers, and proved to be a secondary draw to his live shows. Elvis joked to the Los Angeles Times in 1970, if the songs don't go over, we can do a medley of costumes. There was a lot of continuity that Elvis thought of and the designers thought of when putting these outfits together. Baloo wasn't just responsible for Elvis's stage outfits. He was soon entrusted with creative control of Elvis's entire wardrobe, and he showed a keen eye for the styles and shapes that best suited the rock and roll icon. He recalled to the Graceland blog, You could be daring as a designer and put anything on Elvis, and he could make it work. And the simplest outfits that didn't seem particularly remarkable on the rack 
transformed into something spectacular when Elvis put them on. He was that beautiful and powerful a presence. In an interview with Elvis Australia, Ballou said he thought that Elvis Presley's favorite outfit of his was the Aloha Eagle suit, which he famously wore for his 1973 Aloha from Hawaii via satellite special. The costume included a cape, and Ballou explained that Elvis told him, Bill, I just want the suit to say America. Ballou had been in Europe when there had been controversy regarding an eagle being displayed on an American embassy. The eagle motif replaced his original idea for an American flag-themed suit, and Elvis was on board. The original cape, featuring an eagle with outstretched wings, was floor-length, but the full-length cape turned out to be too heavy for Presley to move in, actually causing him to fall over when he attempted to rehearse in it. Ballou replaced it with a short cape and later recalled, All these years I always carried this image in my head of Elvis making the step forward and then BAM, laying there amongst all this cape, and I can see him howling with laughter too. Though Ballou designed the outfits, much of the embroidery was designed and stitched by his co-worker, Jean Doucette. Doucette told The Guardian in 2010 that he sketched the original eagle idea for the Aloha Eagle suit and explained his costuming philosophy. I didn't just want glitter, I wanted a story. Fashion trends in general are unhealthy for your wallet. It can also be unhealthy for your self-esteem once enough time passes for you to see how cringy your cutting-edge haircuts or clothes were at the time. Few of the things people wear today, however, are known to be actively harmful. But it was very different back in the 1800s when some articles of clothing were actually dangerous to the people wearing them. Women's corsets, for example, could be so tight that their wearers would faint due to breathing difficulties. Think about the instances of women suddenly passing out in Victorian-era books and plays. Their corsets might have something to do with it. Even worse, corsets have since been proven to be the cause of serious internal injuries, including deformation of the ribcage and digestive dysfunction. You like pain? Try wearing a corset. Around the turn of the 20th century, there was even a risk of being poisoned by your own shoes, especially if you'd gone through the effort to dye them elegantly black. One story reported by the Montreal Gazette from 1900 concerns a French girl who complained of sudden dizziness, an affliction that soon affected the girl's siblings. Soon, the children's lips had turned blue. Fortunately, they figured out the culprit, the children's shoes, which had all just been freshly dyed from yellow to black to prevent dirt from showing so easily. The dye in question turned out to contain aniline, a toxic chemical that, when wet, can easily be absorbed through the skin. Once in the bloodstream, aniline causes a chemical change in the blood that affects hemoglobin, which is essential for the transfer of oxygen. The hemoglobin changes to methemoglobin, which causes methemoglobinemia, a condition that turns lips, skin, and fingernails a bluish-purple hue. Unfortunately, this condition can be deadly. Aniline remained a common ingredient in shoe dye well into the 20th century. As late as 1990, there was a case involving a young man becoming semi-comatose within hours of exposure to the dye. Thankfully, such instances are increasingly rare. However, according to the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, those whose work environments include interaction with dyes, polishes, or other industrial substances may be at risk of long-term exposure to aniline. In response, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has passed regulations that ensure there are no more than five parts of aniline per million parts of air in industrial workplaces. Environmental health bodies have investigated aniline levels in the general environment, but they have found little evidence to suggest it exists at hazardous levels as a result of industry. Nevertheless, it is advised that children not play at waste sites due to the risk of potential aniline exposure. While fatal aniline poisoning through one's shoes was a freak occurrence in the Victorian era, the dyes used in socks reportedly irritated the feet of men who wore them. Even worse, those dyes caused bladder cancer in the people who worked with them, according to National Geographic. Meanwhile, nerve damage was common in women who wore makeup containing lead, which was widely used to give them a pale complexion. Some say the term mad as a hatter may have come from the Victorian era when hat makers used mercury as an adhesive to attach animal fur to hats. Some say to survive it, you need to be as mad as a hatter, which luckily I am. The mercury was known to cause cardiorespiratory, neuromotor, and psychological problems. On top of that, it caused teeth to fall out and sometimes early death. There was a whole range of Victorian fashions, besides the dreaded corset that could potentially be fatal to the 19th century folks who wore them. But perhaps the deadliest was the crinoline trend. Wide frocks or hoop skirts of extravagant width drew plenty of criticism from cartoonists of the day because of the perception that they imposed on the women's husbands due to their size. While criticism tended to focus on the etiquette offenses of crinolines, the actual risk was that they were a fire hazard. Crinoline wearers often knocked over candles and lanterns, which easily set the flammable dresses on fire, killing many who wore these garments. 
If you've ever felt like a jabroni after losing your wallet, just say to yourself, hey, at least I've never lost track of a set of priceless crown jewels. The same cannot be said, however, for 19th century booze-loving braggart Arthur Vickers. In 1831, the Irish crown jewels were commissioned as symbols of the British crown's power over Ireland. Whenever the king or queen visited the island, the jewels, consisting of a jeweled star of the Order of St. Patrick and a diamond brooch and five gold collars, were kept there for the monarch and others to wear on formal occasions. According to History Ireland magazine, Magazine, it was when performing duties related to the Order of St. Patrick, such as knighting people, that the ruler would wear the Irish crown jewels. At other times, they were stored securely at Dublin Castle per the protocol of the order. Clearly, said secure storage wasn't exactly airtight, and the monarchy would soon be waving bye-bye to the Irish crown jewels. The crown jewel. The crown jewels? Yes, the crown jewels. In 1903, security began to lapse, ironically, with the building of a new strong room at Dublin Castle. While the room itself was completed professionally in a moment of pure farce, officials discovered that the safe in which the crown jewels of Ireland were traditionally kept was too big to fit into the room. The man in charge of the protection of the jewels was a man named Arthur Vickers, the Ulster King of Arms, who suggested that the safe be moved to his library. Despite having a long and distinguished career, Arthur Vickers was far from ideal for the job of Ulster King of Arms. He had a habit of showing the precious crown jewels of Ireland in his possession to his many guests, and often misplaced his keys, including those to the safe. In one instance, according to Dublin Castle, the crown jewels were stolen as a joke while Vickers was drunk. Talk about a prank, huh? I'm the best with the pranks, man. They call me Prank Sinatra. In early 1907, the Irish crown jewels were under lock and key in preparation for the summer arrival of King Edward VII, who was due to wear them at the 1907 Irish International Exhibition. However, things were off from June 28th to July 6th. According to our location, in that time, Vickers lost his key to Bedford Tower, did nothing when the cleaning woman later found the tower door unlocked, and also did nothing on July 6th when she found a strong room key, which shared its ring with a library key in its lock. Hours later, according to Atlas Obscura, when the library sentry was sent to put a repaired collar in the safe, he found it unlocked and almost completely empty. They've left to steal a crown jewel. Yup, the crown jewels. They were gone. As the dust settled and the Order of St. Patrick realized that they had been victims of one of the biggest heists in Irish history, the bizarre circumstances that led to the loss of the priceless crown jewels started coming to light, such as the fact that Arthur Vickers was something of a party animal who was so drunk that it affected the execution of his duties, like the protection of the Irish crown jewels. The crown jewels. Yes, the crown jewels. As noted by the Vintage News, Vickers himself, a prime suspect and desperate to prove his innocence, even went so far as to attend a seance that was recommended to him. He then spent time furiously searching a cemetery once it was claimed at this gathering that the jewels were buried there. They were not. Growing desperate, Vickers even considered bringing in his cousin, Sherlock Holmes author Arthur Conan Doyle, to use his crime writer's mind to potentially help crack the case. Of course, he was unsuccessful, and Vickers was eventually cast into exile, his career destroyed by the scandal. The Irish Crown Jewels were unable to be present at that year's Irish International Exhibition to the great embarrassment of King Edward VII. The ultimate fate of the Irish Crown Jewels remains a mystery to this day. They have never been recovered, and the original reward of £1,000 that was posted for its recovery is still unclaimed over a century after the jewels went missing. In the years since, countless sleuths, both professional and amateur, have drawn their conclusions as to what happened to the priceless symbols of the Order of St. Patrick. While Arthur Vickers himself remained the prime suspect in many people's eyes, others claim that the jewels were stolen by Vickers' mistress and that she fled with them to France. However, after his frantic efforts to recover the jewels, Vickers himself eventually accused Francis Shackleton, the brother of the explorer Ernest Shackleton, who Vickers claimed had a key to the safe and used the jewels to pay his debt. Some modern researchers have agreed Vickers' story is possible, and that the thief likely got Vickers drunk to accomplish it. 